Welcome to Biblical Foundations, a podcast of the Center for Biblical Studies at Midwestern Baptist Theological Seminary. I'm your co-host, Quinn Mosier, along with Dr. Andreas Kostenberger. Join us as we discuss issues in biblical scholarship for the church. Well, thank you for joining us today at Biblical Foundations. We continue our series through the Gospel of John with one of the most famous episodes from this beloved gospel, Jesus' discussion with Nicodemus. There's a story about the famous 18th century preacher George Whitfield, who was known to preach on this text many times over in his ministry. One time a friend came up and asked him, George, why is it that you preach so often, ye must be born again? Whitfield stared at him for a moment and then said, because ye must be born again. Some of the most widely recognized words from Scripture in our culture today result from Jesus' discussion with Nicodemus. This text has been used by countless preachers and evangelists to call people to salvation in Christ. If you want to enter the kingdom of God, you must be born again. So listen in now to episode 52, Jesus and Nicodemus. All right, well, uh, welcome back for my third and final lecture today in our For the Church workshop on John's Gospel. I hope these lectures have been informative and spiritually nurturing as well. Um, My first lecture, I've tried to make a case for the Apostle John being the author. We've also spent some time studying John's prologue as he sets the stage for the entire rest of the Gospel. And then in the second lecture just now, I've covered the first portion of the Cana cycle, chapter 2, where John narrates Jesus' first sign, the turning of water into wine and the cleansing of the temple in Jerusalem, which I've argued uh, is also a sign, the second sign in John's gospel, one of Jesus' Jerusalem signs. And uh, now my third and final lecture, I want to talk about the remainder of the Cana cycle, chapters 3 and 4, where John features two parallel characters, Nicodemus and the Samaritan woman, uh, one of my favorites, and then concludes the cycle with the healing of the Gentile centurion's son. In this way, John shows, by the way, uh, Jesus' mission from Jerusalem, Nicodemus, to Samaria, the Samaritan woman, to Gentiles, the centurion's son, ends of the earth. Uh, This shows that the early church's mission, as narrated in the book of Acts, see especially Acts 1.8, is grounded in the mission of none other than the early Jesus himself. I believe this is one of several clues that John may not only have read Matthew, Mark, and Luke, but even the book of Acts, which almost certainly had been written by the time he composed his gospel, Um, or at least he would have been aware of its existence and basic narrative layout. He certainly wrote after the mission to the Gentiles was already in full swing. Another clue, by the way, is the very fact that John structures his gospel in two parts. As I mentioned, the book of signs and then the book of exaltation. In the first part, John narrates Jesus' ministry to the Jewish people, especially the seven messianic signs, all in, in, in the first part. And then in the second part, John narrates uh, Jesus' ministry to the twelve, the Jewish believing remnant, the new messianic community. Uh, This is where he anticipates, as I mentioned, Jesus' exaltation with the Father and the church's mission once he's been crucified, buried, and risen. um, Or as in John, he simply refers to it as having gone back to the Father. So you see, John sets out to accomplish in two halves of his one gospel what Luke accomplishes in two separate but related volumes, the Gospel of Luke and the Book of Acts which is yet another possible way in which John's structure and overall approach may reflect his awareness of other New Testament writings such as Luke Acts. Now, um, as we begin to study John's parallel accounts of Nicodemus and the Samaritan woman in chapters 3 and 4, we notice that they start not with chapter 3, verse 1, but with chapter 2, verse 23 whereby 2.23 to 25 serves both as a conclusion to the temple clearing and at the same time as an introduction to the Nicodemus narrative. So if you're preaching or teaching on this portion of John, 
I would strongly recommend you start in John 2.23 and then go until 3.15 or 3.21, as it were. Say more about that later. You could either preach two sermons, one each on John 3 and John 4, or do what I'm doing here and preach on both together as a study of contrast. As mentioned, there are several links between 2.23 to 25 and 3.1 following that suggest that John wants us to read 2.23 to 25 as an introduction to the Nicodemus narrative. So I'm saying this is not just me saying it. I'm trying to discern John's own authorial intent just by looking at some of the verbal similarities. Uh, in 2.23, John writes that many believed in Jesus when they saw the signs he was doing. And then in 3.2, Nicodemus says, no one can do these things signs that you do unless God is with him. It's a back reference. Also in 224 to 25, John writes that Jesus did not entrust himself to them, that is, the people who appeared to believe in him, which is a play on words in the original, they trusted in him, supposedly, but he did not trust them or their uh, superficial uh, confession. The reason why Jesus trusted no one is that he knew what was in people's hearts and therefore needed no one to bear witness about man, anthropos. He already knew what was in man, again, anthropos. And then chapter 3, verse 1 opens like this. Now, there was a man, again, the word anthropos, of the Pharisees named Nicodemus. And this man came to Jesus by night. And so the word Anthropos, in chapter 3, verse 1, is totally unnecessary. Except, of course, if the evangelist wanted to tie in the Nicodemus narrative with the introduction in 2, 24 and 25. He could have just said there was a Pharisee named Nicodemus. You get the point. Now, when we reconnect what is severed by the English chapter division, and those chapter divisions are often very helpful, sometimes obscure you know, deeper connections between uh, chapters, it becomes clear that Nicodemus is one of those men or people to whom Jesus did not entrust himself because he knew what was in their hearts. And despite their external expressions of faith or even use of flattery, as in Nicodemus's case, they didn't truly understand who he was. So in this way, we can see Nicodemus as a representative character of people who profess to be open to Jesus, but who lack true spiritual insight and understanding into who he is, and therefore also lack spiritual regeneration. Not only this, Nicodemus becomes a representative of all of Judaism, which despite all of its external religious rituals and temple worship, lacked true spiritual life and vitality. This is reminiscent of Jeremiah's prophecy regarding a new covenant in which God would write his law into people's hearts, as well as Ezekiel's vision of the valley of dry bones in chapter 37, and his repeated predictions of future divine cleansing and renewal for God's people, Ezekiel 36, uh, 25 and 26. So for those readers who understand the connection between 2.23 to 25 and the Nicodemus narrative starting in chapter 3 verse 1, they will read chapter 3 with a hefty grain of salt. Scholars debate whether Nicodemus is coming to Jesus by night is symbolic of him being in spiritual darkness. Personally, I tend to think that that's just when he came, but it's possible that there are negative spiritual overtones as well. That's certainly the case with the reference to Judas, remember in the upper room, where it says, He slipped outside, and then it says ominously, and it was night. I think it's it's rather clear that in that latter reference in 1330, you do have a reference to spiritual darkness. In this case, I'm not quite as certain, especially because at the end of of, uh, the Gospel of John, John mentions Nicodemus having come to him by night, not necessarily in a negative sense, if you remember that reference. In any case... When Nicodemus calls Jesus rabbi, it's a nice thing to do. 
much older, and tells him that we know that you're a teacher come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Also, the surface sounds very nice. We are, just like Jesus was, not quite ready to take these compliments at face value especially in a culture where opening pleasantries were commonly expected and extended before getting to the point of, of one's visit. You see that even in, in most of Paul's letters. Um, and by the way, Peter Cotterell and Max Turner have a great study of the Nicodemus narrative in their book, Linguistics and Biblical Interpretation. So we're not surprised when we find that Jesus doesn't fall for the flattery either, but instead immediately Cuts to the change. He completely changes the topic and gets to the heart of the matter. No small talk here. And he says, uh, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. This incidentally is the only time the kingdom of God in this uh, unit uh, where the kingdom of God is mentioned in all of John's gospel. Though Jesus speaks of his kingdom, not kingdom of God, just my kingdom, at the Roman trial before Pilate in 1836. Normally, John avoids kingdom of God language and replaces it with speaking of eternal life. For first century Palestinian Jews, how one enters God's kingdom was a vital question, as it was for Nicodemus. And so uh, Jesus asserts that one does so only if one has been born again, or born from above. The Greek word anothen, uh, and one presumes also the Aramaic equivalent, has the, the potential of double meaning. That is, it can mean both again and from above. As you do word study of, of that Greek word, if you look up the instances in a uh, Greek concordance of the New Testament. For example, the same word, is used in the other Gospels when speaking of the temple veil tearing from top to bottom, that is literally from above, at the crucifixion. For example, Matthew 27, 51. And there's other places where the word means again. Nicodemus, lacking spiritual insight, promptly misunderstands and thinks Jesus spoke literally of being born again. That is a second time when the readers know Jesus was speaking about a birth from above, that is, spiritual birth, especially since John already talked about this matter in the prologue when he wrote, but to all who did receive him who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God who are born, not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor the will of man, but of God. John 1, 12 to 13. So John's readers are already well prepared. Uh, uh, they know more than Nicodemus does at this point in the narrative. So Jesus then clarifies in verse 5. What he said in verse 3, uh, namely that what he meant was unless one is born of water and spirit. That's what he means by born from above. He cannot enter the kingdom of God. So born of water could refer to natural birth or possibly water baptism. But more likely echoes Ezekiel's prophecy as mentioned where God says, I will sprinkle clean water on you and you shall be clean. From all your uncleannesses and from all your idols, I will cleanse you. I will give you a new heart uh, and a new spirit. Uh, Ezekiel 36, 25 and 26. Water, therefore, is an emblem or metaphor for spiritual cleansing, accompanied by God giving people a new heart. Many translations, incidentally, I could be wrong on this, capitalized spirit in verse 5, indicating that they think Jesus spoke to Nicodemus about a new birth by the Holy Spirit. Personally, I think it's maybe more likely that Jesus was merely talking about a spiritual birth with a small S here. Look at the next few verses where Jesus says, that which is born of flesh is flesh, and that which is, bo which is born of spirit is spirit. The wind, which is the same word as spirit in the Greek pneuma, blows where it wishes, and you hear it sound, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of spirit. Again, most translations capitalize spirit here, but I believe Jesus may be merely contrasting a natural birth, um, born of flesh, and a spiritual birth, born of spirit, sarx and pneuma, rather than specifying the agent of a new birth as the Holy Spirit, which would in any case have been lost 
on Nicodemus in the present conversation. Uh, Nicodemus simply replies incredulously, how can these things be? Verse 9. Now notice, unlike the Samaritan woman in the next chapter, who gets more and more into the conversation, uh, and if you actually do a word count in the Greek, and presumably same old true in the English, uh, her comments get gradually more and more uh, extensive. Nicodemus's comments get shorter and shorter. You look at verses 2, verses 4, and then in verses 9, and verse 9 is the last we hear of Nicodemus in this story. Though, of course, uh, as I mentioned, uh, John refers to him uh, at two more later occasions, uh, a Sanhedrin trial at the end of chapter 7, and then Jesus' burial, uh, 1939. So first Jesus, and then the fourth evangelist, John, take it from there. Jesus, for his part, chides Nicodemus for his lack of spiritual understanding. He says, are you the teacher of Israel, and yet you do not understand these things? Uh, in other words, he, uh, Nicodemus should have known about spiritual birth from passages uh, such as Ezekiel or Jeremiah. And then the argument from the lesser to the greater, and if the teacher of Israel doesn't know such vital matters, what does it tell us about the rest of Judaism? In what follows, Jesus broadens the scope and shifts from the singular to the plural. Can't see that in English, unfortunately, because it's you either way. Uh, but there's a different Greek word. So he mimics Nicodemus' own language at the beginning when he had told Jesus, we know, first person plural, uh, that you are a teacher come from God. Jesus now says, truly, truly, I say to you, we speak of what we know and bear witness to what we've seen, but you, you people, now you in the plural, not just Nicodemus, but him as a representative character for Judaism, you people don't receive our testimony, verse 11. Most likely, his reference to we in the plural includes previous witnesses such as the prophets or perhaps also current witnesses such as his disciples along with Jesus himself. Uh, Jesus goes on to say in verse 12, if I've told you earthly things and you do not believe, how can you believe if I tell you heavenly things? The teaching about a new birth is not only elementary, at least for Jesus, but earthly, while the teaching about Jesus' true heavenly origin and his upcoming cross work is more advanced and heavenly. Because Jesus identifies himself as the Son of Man, of course, allusion to Daniel 7.13, who descended from heaven and will return to heaven. And so he speaks of his future Lifting up. Um, See, my servant will be high and lifted up. Sound familiar? Isaiah 52, 13. So he's essentially implying that he is fulfilling the um, prophecy in Isaiah's third servant song. Uh, in Isaiah uh, 53, famous passage. So the son of man, Daniel, will be lifted up. Isaiah, just as Moses, Exodus, lifted up the serpent in the wilderness. Very thick web of Old Testament references. You're likely familiar with the story of in Numbers 21, during Israel's wilderness wanderings during the Exodus. When the people complained that God brought them up from Egypt to die in the wilderness, God sent fiery serpents so that many died. When the people repented and Moses interceded for them, God provided a rather peculiar means of deliverance. He told Moses to lift up a bronze serpent. By the way, their serpent is a good thing, not as in, you know, Satan, a bad thing. Uh, Got to be careful there. Uh, and the life of every Israelite who looked at it and believed was spared. In the same way, Jesus says God would lift him up so that everyone who would look at him in faith would receive eternal spiritual life. And by the way, there's two more so-called lifted up sayings in John 8, 28 and John 12, 32 to 34. Uh, look especially at John 12, 33, where it says, he said this to show by what kind of death he was going to die. 
So you see the progression in those three lifted up sayings uh, where John gradually reveals that by lifting up, he's referring to the way Jesus was going to die by being lifted up and hence being exalted on the cross. So Jesus was preaching the gospel to Nicodemus. How cool is that? In this way, the entire conversation with the teacher of Israel becomes a penetrating and highly instructive case study for us of how to share the gospel with a nominal Christian, a religious person who thinks that they're already saved when they're really not. You ask them if they know about their need for a spiritual rebirth and proclaim to them that they can be born again if they believe in the crucified and risen Jesus. I've had conversations like this with um, my own mother and father and sister, all of whom come from a Roman Catholic background, where similarly traditions often obstruct a true spiritual understanding in the central place of the gospel, just like they did um, in Nicodemus's day. Now, the device Jesus used to preach the gospel from the Old Testament, I might add, uh, to Nicodemus is that of typology. Uh, let me say a little bit about typology. It's fascinating. I know some of you are really interested in that. Uh, typology is a device by which one establishes a historical, typical connection between God's acts in earlier times, the type, and his later acts in salvation history, the antitype. Notice that I said historical. In the present case, the original instance, the type, took place in the days of the Exodus. While the corresponding event, the antitype, was to take place in the near future, at the crucifixion. The pattern of correspondence was between an original lifting up of an object, the bronze serpent, and people looking at it in faith. And a later lifting up of another object, Jesus, and people looking at him, again, in faith. So, there is a historical pattern of correspondence based on the dual notion that history unfolds progressively along certain lines and that God acts consistently in history. What's more, not only is there a typical historical pattern, the pattern is shown to be of an escalating nature. In other words, the pattern doesn't merely repeat itself, but there's a further development from type to any type. So in the present case, it's clear to see that the development is from the preservation of physical life to the reception of spiritual, eternal life. And there's also a massive further escalation from Moses lifting up the bronze serpent to God giving his one and only son, the Lord Jesus Christ, and him being lifted up on a Roman cross as God's lamb who gave his life for the sins of the world. So Jesus here provides us uh, with a textbook example of typology in grounding his future cross death in a scriptural antecedent, of which Nicodemus would have been well aware. What's more, Jesus didn't merely show off his ability to unearth typology. He didn't just try to show just how vast his grasp of scripture was. I think he genuinely sought to illustrate the spiritual dynamic underlying the crucifixion with a biblical example to enhance its plausibility and to show its spiritual undergirding just as he tried to explain the nature of the spiritual birth uh, by an illustration from nature, the mysterious character of the wind. Uh, moving on, uh, verse 15 seems to be transitional, moving from Jesus' words to the evangelist's commentary. It's very interesting. Just compare the wording in verse 15 and 16. And you'll see the phrase in verse 15 that whoever believes in him may have eternal life being almost perfectly word for word repeated in verse 16, famous John 3:16, that whoever believes in him should have eternal life. What that tells me is that verses 16 to 21 
are almost certainly commentary by the evangelist. So, sorry if you have a red letter edition where verses uh, 16 to 21 are in red. Um, not that it detracts in any way from, from our beloved verse, uh, John 3, 16. But what I'm arguing here is that it's probably not Jesus uttering it, but rather this is uh, John's commentary on Jesus' statement to Nicodemus. Now, I've had entire sermons preached, uh, you probably have as well, where people would take, you know, for, and then God, and then so, and then love, and commented on each uh, word, uh, spent about 40 minutes doing so, so we don't have time here to unpack that, that uh, wonderful verse completely. Uh, I myself have written a, a whole article on, on just one aspect of, uh, of John 3.16 that I hadn't noticed uh, until fairly recently, namely that for Nicodemus, the idea that God loves the entire world would have been anything but self-evident. He may not have believed that God loves the entire world. Uh, rather, first century Jews, as we can see from, from the Jewish sources we have, commonly believed that God only loved Israel while reserving the Gentiles for judgment. Certainly see that in the Qumran literature, Dead Sea Scrolls, in the so-called War Scroll. But a little closer to home, think of Jesus' statement in the Sermon on the Mount, uh, where he says, You've heard it said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. In other words, you should love your fellow Jew and hate the despicable Gentiles. And then Jesus said, but I say that you love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. So this then would be another aspect of escalation in Jesus' typology. Well, in the first instance, it was Israelites whose lives were preserved during the Exodus. Jesus' death on the cross would be an expression of God's love for the whole world. And that as a result, whoever believed in Jesus would receive eternal life. I mean, Nicodemus' head was already spinning. You know, I mean, that probably would have made it spin a few times more. Also, for those of you still thinking about whether or not Jesus or John, out of John 3.16, I'd ask you to consider that the reference to Jesus as God's one and only son, Greek word is monogenes, famous expression sometimes rendered as only begotten, um, so there's, there's only four references to monogenes in the whole gospel. Two are found in our passage here in John 3, 16 and 17 or 18. And the other two in the prologue, uh, John 1, 14 and 1, 18. And we know who wrote the prologue, right? It was the evangelist. And so by the same token, uh, I would argue that uh, the use of the word monogenes here in John 3.16 again suggests that most likely it was the evangelist who wrote that and not Jesus. One more piece of evidence. Uh, look what Jesus just called himself twice in verses 13 and 14. He called himself the son of man. So that's Jesus' self-designation, uh, the son of man. And then you have this almost imperceptible transition between verse 14, Son of Man, to um, the reference to uh, God's one and only Son, which was the evangelist um, label for Jesus. A uh, little bit more on this expression monogenes, by the way. Uh, both the reference to Jesus as God's one and only Son and also to God giving his son. God so loved the world that he gave his son. Usually in John, uh, what does it say? It doesn't say God gave his son, but God sent his son. I think uh, both of those echo uh, the Abraham narrative in Genesis 22, the famous near sacrifice of Isaac, uh, who in the Septuagint is called Abraham's Morogenes. Would you believe it? His one and only Son, on the account of the fact that he, not Ishmael, was the son God had promised to Abraham. So Genesis 22, 2 says, take your son, your only son, 
even though he had Ishmael. Uh, Isaac, whom you love. So there you even see the parallelism between only son and beloved son. When God, the, the voice from heaven at the baptism and the, the transfiguration says, this is my beloved son. I think it's a virtual synonym to one and only uh, son. If you're somebody's one and only son, you're especially beloved by them. Um, so we see in this whole passage several vital connections between Jesus and the cross on the one hand and the Old Testament on the other. Just taking inventory. References to Abraham and Isaac, Moses and the Exodus, an important allusion to Isaiah, the servant being lifted up, and another allusion to Ezekiel's prophecy of the new birth. So much for unhitching the New Testament from the Old. We can see that Jesus and John here do the exact opposite. They show the grounding of the gospel in the soil of Old Testament narrative, typology, and prophecy. And in this way, render the gospel more intelligible and skillfully illumine its deeper meaning. We don't have time to continue our study of chapter 3 in quite as thorough a fashion with the verses that follow in the remaining chapter, just by way of brief summary, following John's commentary in verses 16 to 21, he again shines the spotlight on John the Baptist, as he's done in the prologue and the rest of chapter 1. Uh, this time he presents him as the friend of the bridegroom, who happily facilitates the wedding of bride and groom, uh, John 3.29. Just like the best man in a wedding, uh, therefore he must fade into the background so as not to steal the spotlight from the happy couple. Uh, and this becomes the subject of the transitional statement in chapter 4, verse 1. Thank you for joining us today at Biblical Foundations. For more information, please visit the Center for Biblical Studies at Midwestern at cbs.mbts.edu. For further resources, also visit biblicalfoundations.org. Join us again next time at the Biblical Foundations Podcast.